so um, now that we are live, um, I am going to just give us a few uh, housekeeping rules before we get going. Um, my name is Jessica. I'm community engagement specialist here at Syosset Library. With me, I have uh, my coworker. Hi, I'm Stacy Mencher, librarian at Syosset Public Library. This event is in webinar mode, which means that the only people who can share their camera and their mic are myself, Stacy, and our wonderful guest, who I will invite to introduce herself in a second. Um, that said, we do encourage audience participation. You can either uh, use the chat or the Q&A function. Stacy and myself will address the questions to Sarah uh, as they come up. However, this is a fun, friendly event. Uh, any, uh, any use of hate speech, semblance of racism or abusive language in the chat or the Q&A will have you immediately removed from the meeting, um, which is a shame, A, because you shouldn't be doing it and it's toxic, and B, because this is going to be an amazing event uh, to talk about this book. So without any further ado, I am going to turn the mic over to Sarah Weidman. Thank you so much for having me, and I really appreciate being able to speak to all of you at the Syosset Public Library. I feel like I need to do a little bit of, of a commercial for how great libraries are, because I feel like now more than ever, with the spate of book bannings that's been happening across the country, it's deeply offensive, it's, it's deeply anger-inducing and dangerous, and we need to just be constantly defending against these these bands be or and these challenges so i'm really glad to be speaking today and just being able to say go libraries so i thought first um i would talk a little bit about what scoundrel is about how i came to write it and then i'm going to do a pretty short reading from an early part of the book so scoundrel is my second nonfiction book after the real lolita which came out in 2018 and that book is on the real life case that inspired Vladimir Nabokov's shocking and controversial novel, speaking of books that have a tendency to be banned. And so that book had emerged out of an article that I wrote for a Canadian magazine called Hazlitt. And so after that piece was published in November, 2014, my editors there wanted to know what I was going to work on next. And I had, in typical fashion for me, done some internet rabbit holing and Wikipedia trawls. And I had known of a comparable case of a writer getting sort of enmeshed in the criminal case of a convicted murderer and how that turned out very badly. And that being Norman Mailer, who would write the Executioner song and Armies of the Night and The Naked of the Dead and be very controversial for his own personal life. He had struck up a correspondence with a man named Jack Henry Abbott, who was in prison for murder while he was working on Executioner's Song. And Mailer was so taken in with Abbott's writing that he, along with other book publishing professionals and literary types, helped get Abbott's work published in the New York Review of Books and would eventually lead to him getting paroled. And then a few years later, Abbott's book, In the Belly of the Beast, is published. And on the very day that that book is given a rave review by the New York Times, Abbott was arrested for murdering a man in a bar fight in Greenwich Village, New York, and he would subsequently spend the rest of his own life in prison. And Mailer got a lot of blowback, and it was a big cause celebre. So this case I knew about, and I would eventually write a piece of my own on that subject. But while researching it, I found a similar thing involving a convicted murderer in New Jersey, named Edgar Smith, and his friendship with William F. Buckley Jr. And for those who are not familiar with Buckley, he was a conservative scion. He founded National Review, which is a magazine that's still today. And its whole motto is, you stand athwart history yelling stop. Um, he would run for mayor of New York City in this sort of quixotic campaign. He had a show called Firing Line. So in the mid 60s in particular, Buckley was really at a forefront of, of the culture as sort of the conservative that people could turn to and maybe even trust for good or for ill. And so he eventually strikes up this 
correspondence and friendship with Edgar Smith, who's on death row. And I was like, and as I will detail in Scoundrel, that also ended in spectacularly horrible fashion. So why didn't I know about this story? So I start researching it and I do some initial reporting in, the, in late 2014. And I soon realized that number one, this isn't a magazine piece, this is a book. And number two, certain people whom I wanted to talk to me just wouldn't because they felt that as long as Edgar was still alive, that they were not really free to share relevant information in, in the way that they felt was possible and could do so safely. So I put the project aside and back burn it, but I never let it go entirely. It's just that I was working on other things. I was editing a collection. I was writing The Real Lolita. And right when I was turning in the first draft of The Real Lolita, I learned that Edgar had died. And suddenly it felt like, okay, if he's gone, then he definitely can't sue anybody for libel. So that's a good thing. And also certain sources then su subsequently agreed to talk to me. And so, what is this whole thing about? How did William F. Buckley get involved in advocating for the innocence of a man who was clearly guilty of the murder of a teenage girl? How did he get fooled and how did others in Edgar's orbit get fooled? So we have to wind the clock back and it's March of 1957. And we begin with a girl named Victoria Zielinski. She's 15 years old. She lives in Ramsey, New Jersey, which is a small town in Bergen County, which for those who are familiar with New Jersey, you just have to drive across the George Washington Bridge and take, I think, Route 80, and you're basically right around there. And in the 50s, these were small towns that were, everybody knew everyone, People, the streets were kind of poorly lit, You, the entertainment was going out to the ice cream place and going out dancing, and you know, people would go out on dates in groups. And Vicky was no exception, she had a group of friends, she was going out on dates with a somewhat older guy named Don Hommel. And that's how she knew Edgar. It was sort of like, they're all in the same friend group. But Edgar, to Vicky's 15, he was 23, recently married. His wife, Patricia, had been pregnant with their first child when they got married. And that child, Patty Ann, was born in basically two days before Christmas. So imagine he has a wife who's 19, a three-month-old baby at home. They live in a trailer park. He has been in the military. He's grown up in sort of peripatetic circumstances. He can't really keep a job. He can't, you know, and he basically wants to act like he's still a single guy, even though he has responsibilities and marriage and children. And so he has been known to, you know, interact with Vicky in a group setting. But on the night of March 4th, she goes out on a walk across along the street where she lives and it will cross into a different town called Mawa where her friend Barbara Nixon lives and they're going to do homework together and again because the streets are poorly lit and it's dark and it's March but it's cold she and her sister younger sister Myrna work at a whole thing where they walk together to a meeting point and then they split and then when it's time to come back they would they had arranged prearranged a time to meet at that same spot and walk home together so the first part, walking together, Vicky goes on to Barbara's house. That happens just fine. But on the way back, Myrna's running a little late. She finally gets to the meeting point. Vicky isn't there. She searches a bit. She goes, she continues on her own, goes to Barbara's house. They said, but Vicky's left. And so Myrna has to walk home alone and tell her parents and family that her older sister is missing. Myrna, by the way, is 13. And they go out in a car, they start searching, they don't find anything. They all stay up all night. And then the next morning, Vicky's father, Anthony, goes out again with his wife and the cops are called there. And then he sees Vicky's scarf and then he follows a trail and he sees other items. And then they end up at the sand pit, not that far from where she was last seen. And her body is at the bottom of it. And so this isn't a case of like an unsolved mystery per se, like the police land on Edgar as a suspect pretty quickly because he'd been acting strangely. He had borrowed a friend's car. When the friend got it back, he saw that there was blood on the passenger seat. And then they would later find Edgar's bloody pants. And the blood type on those pants was type O, which was Vicky's type, because in 1957, it was long before you had DNA evidence. So they were using blood types and other sort of more circumstantial forensic science type techniques. 
he's arrested, there's a trial, it's a circus, it gets coverage not only in New Jersey, but across the way, all the New York tabloids cover it, the wire services cover it, people who live in Bergen County basically treat it as entertainment, and one of them is the esteemed crime writer Mary Higgins Clark, who would later reference this case directly in her breakout suspense novel, Where Are the Children? So it was a real privilege and kind of a trip to be able to ask her, why did you do that? And she, so, she, so she told me, well, I attended this trial. And at that trial, because trials, they have drama, but a lot of it is pretty tedious. But this particular one was really rife with some major moments because Edgar's defense was that essentially not only did some other guy do it, but the guy who did it was the man, the young man that Vicky knew, Don Hommel. And, and Edgar's whole line was, yeah, Vicky got in my car, we had a fight because she said something mean about my wife. And yeah, maybe I hit her and maybe there was an, a, an argument. But then I left because I saw that Hummel was there. And it, it, it's just completely ridiculous. But, and the good thing is, is that the jury didn't believe that at all. And Edgar testifies in his defense and it just does not go well. So he is convicted. The jury takes less than two hours to arrive at a death sentence. And so in some true crime stories, that's where the story might end. But not this one. This is just the beginning because Edgar refuses to die. He has he is scheduled for executions. They are stayed at one point in 1958, about a year after this happens. He comes within 30 minutes of being executed. His wife is sticking by him for the first few years. And then several more years pass and he realizes that if he's going to live, he has to kind of quote, make something of himself. So he enrolls in college correspondence classes. He gets books from the prison library at death row on, in New Jersey State's prison system. And he starts kind of corresponding with people. And in one interview that he gives with a friendly reporter, he mentions a prison official who had brought copies of National Review among the magazines that were available. And then because that official got moved to a different prison, he no longer had access to National Review. And then Buckley learns of this through another colleague who would later write a piece for NR about Smith. And that's how their correspondence begins. So it's really just because Edgar mentions this magazine, which it would later turn out he hadn't even read. He just mentioned it because like it was something to mention. But Buckley, <laughs> because he was reading all of his press, got really interested. And so his colleague first corresponds and then Buckley begins to talk about like legal stuff, but then it just keeps developing over time. And subsequently Buckley and Smith would talk, would exchange about 1500 pages worth of letters, which I was able to view at Buckley's archives at Yale University. And from that initial correspondence in particular, because the so-called friendship really does develop between 62 and 64 and a little bit 65, Buckley writes a piece for Esquire magazine called The Approaching End of Edgar H. Smith Jr. Because by this point, he has bought into Edgar's line that he is innocent of killing Vicky, that it was Hommel or some other guy or whatever, but just he didn't do it. And so Buckley writes this whole piece outlining what are the perceived flaws in the case and why there should be grounds for at least a new trial. And at the very end of the article, there's a link to, not a link, <laughs> there's like a, a mailing address for how you can send money to a defense fund. And one of the people who wrote in, and she really becomes the heart of the story that I am telling in Scoundrel, is a book editor named Sophie Wilkins. She is working at Knopf. She's been there for a few years. She's had a very interesting and fascinating life of her own. She was an emigre from Vienna. Uh, as a refugee. She married several times and she's on her third husband. By this point, Thurman Wilkins, who's an academic who is suffering from some very tough mental health issues. And Sophie is essentially caregiving. She's not really happy in her job. She doesn't really fit in. She has a very gregarious and outgoing personality and is perceived as exhausting by her colleagues who are much more reserved and quiet and sort of self-contained. So when she learns of this article, which quotes letters from Edgar Smith, who, because of all of his like self-direction and ability to kind of mimic what Buckley himself, how he writes in this very erudite, laconic fashion, she thinks that he has literary talent and asks Buckley 
is he writing a book? And at that point, the answer was no. But by the summer of 67, it's a very different answer because Edgar is many thousands of words into a treatise, a nonfiction book that would outline his so-called innocence. And so Sophie Wilkins now strikes up a correspondence that at first is strictly professional. But as I discovered when I was working in her archives at Columbia University, uh, what was initially a professional correspondence between prospective book editor and author soon becomes something far more. They just keep pushing each other to different levels of inappropriateness. And by the end of that year, they're declaring love for one another and uh, the correspondence is getting quite x-rated and so you have to imagine i'm sitting in the rare books and manuscripts library of columbia university thinking i'm just going to be reading this like anodyne correspondence and then realizing what is this how what have i just found and trying not to like hold I, i'm trying to hold in my reaction and not scream because it's a library and you're supposed to be quiet <laughs> but that's when i knew that scoundrel really had the makings of a book because it wasn't just about the relationship and the betrayal that happened of William F. Buckley's belief, but it was that here was this other woman, Sophie Wilkins, who had invested so much of her own personal and professional time and energy into Edgar, who was essentially running kind of a long con on her because she would because he was taking advantage of weaknesses in her own personality, that she was prone to being hypergraphic, that she was prone to spilling a lot about herself. And he would just go and amplify that yet more. So it just, it really almost became deranged, but I couldn't stop reading too. And it was this very curious thing where knowing what I knew about Edgar, especially because to kind of fast forward, the book is published, the Supreme Court rules that his confession is uh, coerced and should be thrown out. He gets a new trial. He pleads guilty to time served. He finally gets out. And he has a few years of being a, a literary celebrity before it all just comes crashing down and he comes very close to killing another woman. But at that point, like someone like Sophie really genuinely believed in his innocence and was just committed to creating this nonfiction book chronicle that would do that. And so what it was just such a wild ride to read through this and knowing all of this that I did and yet I still found myself kind of being sucked into Edgar's version of the story. I would read Brief Against Death, which was this resulting book. It came out in 68. And I knew what he left out. I knew what he kind of obfuscated. I knew what he was outright lying about. And I knew that he was painting Vicky Zielinski in a light that was really quite gross, that he would just highlight her attractiveness, her physical appearance, her so-called sexual activity or whatever. This was even more pronounced in a novel that Edgar would write and publish a couple of years later, which Sophie did not work on for reasons. But it just felt like throughout this whole process, everybody was forgetting that here was a 15 year old girl who not only was she murdered, but the state of her body was so brutalized, the medical examiner ruled she was decerebrated, which is essentially like, it's not just that your head is smashed in, it's that it's completely obliterated. Like this was a rage crime. And the level of rage that Edgar had could not be overcome by literary success and having famous and not so famous friends come to bat for him. And he had so many collateral, there was so much collateral damage and so many victims. His, both of his wives he abused he was he behaved very strangely and menacingly to other women in his life and it was really important in scoundrel to tell the story yes it he is the titular scoundrel but he to me is the least interesting person in the story that there were so many other particularly the women and girls that he harmed whose stories i wanted to impart in some way that they felt more human and more regarded so I think that's also a good place for me to do a little bit of a reading. So I've mentioned Victoria Zielinski. She was the 15 year old girl whose life was taken on the night of March 4th, 1957. And because of how I structured Scoundrel, the introduction, you basically know everything that's going to happen. Like I didn't want to write a whodunit. I didn't want to write 
a story of sort of cheap suspense. I did want it to feel suspenseful because there are revelations and new new material and new interviews and things that no one else has ever published on this case. But it was kind of important for me structurally to start at the end and kind of end at the beginning. And that, even though we're talking about a mid 20th century story, that is a little bit of a spoiler. So I will let readers discover exactly what I mean here. But if we knew what Edgar was capable of, it took the wind out of the sail. So you could try as a reader to understand how the hell this all happened. But in order to understand how this all happened, we have to start with Vicky. So with that, I'm going to read a little bit from chapter one. It's called Where is Vicky? In March of 57. First, Vicky. She was the Zelinsky's second child. Mary Fay was the eldest, given the same first name as her mother and grandmother. Victoria Ann arrived three years after her sister, born on, six, born on September 6, 1941. Then came Myrna, two years later, and finally a couple of years after that, Anthony Jr. The Zelinskys met, married, and started their family in Honsdale, Pennsylvania, and had moved to Ramsey, New Jersey, after a short stint in Hoboken, when Vicky was seven or eight. Anthony's and Mary's ancestors had come from Poland and Austria, respectively, earlier in the 20th century. A nuclear family, yes. A happy one? The record says otherwise. Vicky complained about her father to her friends, usually about his curfew enforcement, always 11 p.m., and she had to call home if she was to be late, and sometimes about his constant drinking. Her complaints occasionally carried whispers of familial violence. That more disturbing undertone would prove more important later, as would so much about what Vicky did or didn't do, what she thought or didn't think, what she wanted or didn't want. Strip all those suppositions away, and what's left is an adolescent girl faring well by 1950s standards. Just a kid, insisted her best friend, Barbara Nixon, describing Vicky more than six decades later, which, at age 15, a shade over five feet and a little more than 110 pounds, was almost certainly true. Vicky was an honor roll student in her freshman year at Ramsey High. She took her study seriously and was particularly keen on learning German. The summer before her sophomore year, she split her time between Ramsey and her birthplace of Honsdale, staying with her Aunt Anna, her mother's sister. In 10th grade, Vicky's marks started to slide. She seemed bored and distracted in class and was often late because she loved to socialize with her friends during the breaks. Vicky's homeroom teacher, Emily Gleckler, found none of, none of those things too worrying. She told the Patterson Evening News that Vicky's grade drop had been typical of sophomores who liked to enjoy themselves. Charles Shams, the vice principal at Ramsey High, added, she was the type who, when they say hello, really meant it and are happy to say it. And Vicky did to enjoy herself. Friday night she spent at the roller rink in Paramus or at the Corral, a hangout for Ramsey teenagers to dance to jukebox tunes. She did not shy away from having fun, though weekend dates with boys and young men never went past her strict curfew. She might flirt with boys she knew, tease them, and kid around with them, but she wasn't known to behave that way with strangers. In early February 1957, Vicky went out with a boy who had a bottle of beer in his car. I won't go with you unless you break that thing, Vicky admonished him. He proceeded to smash the bottle. One unnamed girlfriend complicated the picture with what she told the Bergen record after Vicky was killed. The friend said Vicky had changed somewhat since the beginning of the year, suggesting that she was, quote, wilder than she used to be. Not wild enough to get into a car with a stranger, of course, but out of, out of step with her earlier self. The kind of girl who became the subject of lurid rumors that she fooled around with older boys. One of the last photos of Vicky shows her standing in front of a white door. The camera peers up at her from a low angle. She holds a pair of figure skates in her left hand, the wrist adorned with a white gold Whitnauer watch. Her right hand rests on her hip, a typical pose evident in other photos taken in Vicky's teen years, while her left leg is bent slightly at the knee. She is clad in dark penny loafers, white socks that stop halfway up her shins, a white turtleneck sweater 
and a dark skirt whose flared hem brushes against her thighs. Her expression is a Rorschach test for whatever one wish wishes to read into it. She could be defiant or playful, coy or confident, childlike or dangerously mature. The gap between her front teeth, plainly visible in photos from earlier in her childhood, is harder to see. And so she seems to teeter on the edge between self-conscious and assured. In the photo, at least, she radiates promise of something far larger than whatever future seemed possible within the walls of her yellow painted home at 496 Wyckoff Avenue. What kind of life was in store for Victoria Zielinski? Would she have moved away from Bergen County across the Hudson River to Manhattan, that tiny isle bursting with outsized dreams, ready to spit out those who couldn't hack it? Or would she have fled the East Coast altogether for somewhere more far flung? The tragedy of early violent death is that it strips away the person and leaves only the act, the making of the dead girl, rather than the celebration of the lived life. The killer has the power. The one who dies loses it all. Victoria Zielinski not only lost her future, her power, and her promise on the night of March 4th, 1957, she lost her existence, overridden by the needs and wants and desires of the man who murdered her. So I thought that would give a small flavor of what Scoundrel is about. And I would love to take some questions. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, wow. Um, I know. So, yeah. So, I mean, I know I have questions and I'm sure Stacy has questions. We do have a few in the yeah. Q&A. And um, once again, um, I do, uh, we encourage guests to drop your questions in the chat in the Q&A because uh, this is why these interactive events are great. All right. Stacy, do you want to take the first one? Um, yeah, again, I just, I wanted to just, mention uh one of our attendees said in chat when you were talking about uh, the inspiration of the book and research and what that much like now murder cases become entertainment it's like it's whole that is an evergreen conclusion unfortunately we have been gawking at lurid murder cases for centuries and i just think it's a primal human instinct it's like when you're on the driving on the highway and there's a car accident and it's almost like you feel compelled to rubberneck. Oh my God, um, yes. And there are all sorts of reasons. It's like, why are women in particular really fascinated and drawn to true crime narratives? And part of it is almost like a, a coping mechanism or it's this idea of this is the worst thing that could happen. And if I know about it, I can arm myself, I can protect myself and this will not happen to me. And that's not actually true. And I think most people know that subconsciously, but it's also why there has been in the past few years in particular some real interrogation of what it actually means to make someone's murder or rape grist for the entertainment mill. And so the, these are questions that I continue to grapple with, not only in my own work, but the work that I edit. And I just feel like if I'm going to be part of the true crime space, I have to understand why people are drawn to it and how we might be complicit and whose stories are not being told and also just like how weighted it is towards, let's say, missing white woman syndrome, or this idea that young, pretty white women are disproportionately going to get coverage over uh, poor black people. And how do we redress that balance if it's even possible to redress those balances? And I think there's been a lot of good work that has been happening, but it will never stop and it can't stop. We do have another uh, just in the chat um, really quickly, um, and I bring this up because uh, he was the first person to say hi when we uh, when we started oh. this program. So yeah, um, uh, so um, thanks very much. Really enjoying this. How long does it take to produce a book like this? That's a great question. I mean, the answer for me is it depends on the book, but Scoundrel. I mean, I mentioned that I started working on it in the fall or the late in the latter months of 2014. And here we are, it's late February, 2022, and it's been published. But even though it is a book that I suppose took seven and a half years, it wasn't like it was a continuous seven and a half years. In that time, I edited and published a two volume collection of crime writer, crime novels by women of the forties and fifties. I wrote and published The Real Lolita, which came out in 2018. I edited an anthology called Unspeakable Acts, which is on uh, modern day true crime writing. 
but all the while I was gathering material and talking to people. So it was very much in stop and starts. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't until I sold a book proposal in the fall of 2018. And when I was done promoting the real Lolita, it's like, okay, the, the sea has parted and now I have space and time to devote fully to m figuring out how to make what became Scoundrel into a book. So from that point, I was working on it exclusively for maybe about two years. I started at the end of 18, turned in a, an early, early draft right when lockdown happened in March of 2020. And then it was fully edited and ready for production. And that includes a, fact, a, a rigorous fact checking process. I hired a checker who was wonderful. Her name was Rosemary Ho. And she not only went through every single document and every single letter and talked to every source that was living whom, who was still willing to talk to us and just did a whole lot of legwork. And this book would not be as comprehensive and as strong without her work, which I just want to be clear, book publishers do not pay for fact checkers. Uh, I wish they would just because I think it would benefit book, books a lot more. But this was, a, it was money that I'm so glad I spent and I don't think I could ever write a nonfiction book again without hiring a checker. So that was all done by I'm trying to think, I think like June of 2021. And then, you know, book publishing being what it is, it just takes a while to go through production and then there are galleys and then it goes out to advanced readers who are supposed to talk it up. And then now we're here and now it's out in the world and it was published on Tuesday. And I'm so glad for readers to get their hands on it. Thank you so much and happy book birthday a few days Thank later, you. by the way. <laughs> we have um, a question in the Q&A. How did you? Yeah. Um, how did your research expand as you discovered more? Was there anything else you wanted to know more about but were unable to access? Um, I would have liked to talk more with the young woman that Edgar married after he got out of prison. So her name is Paige Heimeyer when, and was also from Bergen County. And when they met, she was 19, which was also the same age that his first wife was when they got married. So he had a type and he, and Paige, like Patricia, they were sort of small, fine bone, looked younger than their years. She had an affinity for music. She loved and still loves animals, but she was 20 years younger and just had not seen much of the world yet. So she marries him and it becomes pretty hellish. Yes, I, I see a, a comment that he had an MO and that's true. Although I, I'm just going to interrupt by saying that I, unlike I think a lot of writers, I, I find myself suspicious of motive. I just feel like a lot of times people kill or behave in ways that are mysteries to themselves. And there were many different reasons that Edgar gave as to why he killed Vicky or then when he would later the claim that he didn't. But the one that I would ultimately settle on which he told the parole board a few years before he died is I was angry. Cause it's like that, that just makes the most sense. It's simple. It's you know, it's emotion laden. It doesn't need to have internal logic. And a lot of time, like that's why these guys are kind of disappointingly familiar and banal and not really that exciting. Like they're not like fictional killers who have been elevated into almost like comic book legends. That's just not, not the way of it. So with Paige, she was one of the people who just felt very nervous about talking to me while Edgar was alive. And then we, after he died, we did have a conversation, but she elected not to cooperate with the book. And I have to respect that. She had been traumatized. She had gone through a lot in her life. And this publishing this book, much as I wanted to tell her part of the story with great care, it can't help but be upsetting. So we all want everybody to cooperate in every facet when we're working on book projects or any kind of projects, but we don't always get what we want. So we have to work around it or just do the best with what's available. And because there was just so much material between court documents and letters and newspaper accounts and other primary sources, I didn't feel the lack so much, but Paige also told me that she wrote a memoir and I, would still like to read it. 
but I also am like that maybe this was just a private thing ultimately. So we'll see. The one thing I can say about writing books, and I know this from the real Lolita, is that just because it's within the pages of a book, like, you know, I have a hardcover here, but the story isn't over because people might reach out to me. I might get new information. And if that's the case, well, I can hopefully update it in the paperback or even if I can't, it's just, it becomes a living and breathing organism that is independent of me. And that's how books kind of have to be. For sure. And I see that they followed up by saying, um, easier to manipulate someone who has not experienced much. Exactly, yes. Because it, their worldview is so limited that these people become all they know. And it's really hard when someone who is essentially older, trying to teach you about life, they teach you all the wrong things and they basically instill a traumatic response in you that you, is very difficult to overcome. Stacy, want to take the next question? Yeah, I don't, this could either be um, the same person or not, but Anonymous said that there's always this need to blame the victim. And then following up on that anonymous or either same anonymous or different said regarding blaming the victim, how do you feel things have changed or not since then? Are there any recent cases that you feel have played out similarly? Well, I think that we try to do better in terms of victim blaming and certainly the recent years of Me Too, there has been a space to believe women when they talk about sexual assault. And granted, a lot of what has come out involves famous people, but there have also been movements in labor and lower middle, lower, you know, working class environments to kind of redress balances of, of great imbalances of power that create opportunities for people to sexually harass and assault people. But the work is by no means over. It's sort of like the racial reckonings that happened in, in 2020, and now there's been the subsequent backlash. And it's just like, is this the cycle that we just keep perpetuating over and over again? Like, are humans stupid? And kind of, I mean, the thing I land on, and especially just watching certain more contemporary stories, I think of what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse, who he killed people, he shot people, but he was acquitted because he could invoke self-defense and is now a right-wing darling. And I take, I see seeds of Edgar Smith in him. I see seeds of Edgar Smith in Anna Sorokin, who, whose, whose life and shenanigans are now this new Netflix series, Inventing Anna. Um, I see it in the Tinder swindler. I see it in any con artist who perpetuates harm upon women in particular. I see it in, it's, I feel like the great American, it, it, it's like the great American dream. The um, flip side is the, is that it makes people much more susceptible to being conned and scammed and that this is part of the American fabric too. And so ultimately what I land on is human behavior doesn't really change across millennia. It's just the technology that's different. Yeah, without a doubt. I was actually thinking about the tins. I, I always say the Tinsler Swindler, the Tinder, Tinder Swindler. Tinder Swindler. <laughs> I was um, thinking about how I was reading that like an agent is trying to pick him up. And I'm just like, really? I think there was some comment I saw on Twitter that the problem with entertainment industries is that they view virality as independent of morality. And mm. it's like they see somebody as is getting famous but they don't understand why that it could be rooted in moral outrage and a similar thing happened to edgar like he gets out he has these famous friends he's written books he gets positive reviews in newspapers uh crime writers like ross mcdonald are reviewing these books favorably james m kane gives him a blurb it's just he becomes almost like the literary darling of the moment and then you know they move on to the next one and he has to actually make something of himself in a civilian life. And he does not have the capabilities for doing so because it's just not in his personality. He, he's disordered. He is capable of murder. He is, has a, a lot of rage that he can no longer suppress. And so he takes it out on women and girls in particular, especially those who have a lot less power than he does. So this just keeps happening again and again. And the, you know, the real stories of true crime are 
intimate partner violence and poverty and income inequality and racism. And we have to look at things from a much more systemic standpoint. And while that's beginning to happen, we always need more of that. Uh, there's something in the chat. Did you wanna get that one, Stacey? Sure. Uh, Katie asks, can you talk about this need for Buckley to be such an advocate for Smith? So what I came to understand about William F. Buckley is that I think the reason that he was, he fell into this is because he genuinely believed that he and Edgar were friends and friendship was a key trait that he prized above so much else, loyalty was as well. And his whole thing was that he didn't want ideology to get in the way of a good friendship. So he was really keen on befriending people who were not conservatives, who did not share his views, that debate was healthy and argument was good. But of course, the problem with that is that you end up, you still end up gravitating towards people who are like yourself. And even in the, in the confines of argument and debate, it's like, well, was William F. Buckley going to befriend a poor black prisoner? No, that just was, it would never have happened because it was not in his wheelhouse to even go there. But someone like Edgar Smith, who seems to be bettering himself and picking himself up by his bootstraps and he's learning and he's studying and he's reading and he's writing well and he's in prison. And here's somebody who's clearly trying to make something of himself considering the harsh conditions of the, of the death house. I mean, Edgar and his fellow prisoners we're only allowed out of a cell one hour a day and they're only allowed to shower once a week. So we would view that as inhumane and we should view that as inhumane. It also doesn't take away from the fact that Edgar was clearly guilty of his crime, but Buckley genuinely believed he was not. And, the, and it was rooted in that. And he was known to be gullible and naive in other certain circumstances. And I think the privilege of his life blinded him to how people could manipulate and con other people. So that's, I think, also why when Edgar went back to prison, Buckley wrote one more piece for Life magazine in 1979, just kind of like trying to work through some stuff. But there was also still some blind spots. And ultimately, he never spoke about it in public again. Unlike Norman Mailer, who I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, he would this would keep coming up for him. With Buckley, it just did not. And there were people that I knew. I actually had some mutual friends who were protégés of Buckley. So they, you know, they were younger, but they, they knew him. And I asked them, did he ever talk about Edgar Smith? And they categorically said, no, it was just not a subject that he ever brought up. So I was able to find someone who could tell me what Buckley was thinking and feeling in the aftermath, in the immediate aftermath of this, but that was it. Nobody, nobody else was privy to anything after about 1979 or 1980, except for Sophie Wilkins, because interestingly enough, even though everything had imploded with Edgar, they managed to sustain a friendship until Sophie's death in 2003. And she would later become sort of his first reader and freelance editor on the series of spy novels that he wrote that became New York Times bestsellers in the mid seventies and onward. And they also shared a love of music, especially Bach, and they had other mutual friends. And that friendship was real and genuine, but it was rooted in this horrible story that they were essentially like survivors of a shared war. And they had no one else to talk about this with because who would understand in the way that only they could. So it was actually really important, not only to tell the story of Edgar and Buckley and Sophie through when he went back to prison, but also show a little bit afterwards. Well, what, how did their friendship sustain itself? And that, I suppose, is a happy ending of a sort, but that also shows the level of loyalty and depth that Buckley had with his friends. That's really interesting. I, ha I have to admit, the first time I ever heard the name William Buckley, embarrassingly, was on an episode of Clarissa Explains It All, where uh, the younger brother names his kitten William F. Buckley. Uh, <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. But that yeah, also, well, I think that goes yeah. to show just the level of cultural consciousness there was about him that after, this often happens too, that after Buckley dies in, in 2008, like so many people, he, they just end up getting forgotten. Mailer 
is not forgotten, but he's just not widely read in the same way that he once was. And Buckley too, and especially with what has been happening to the far right, I think there's a certain mockery that people have of Buckley and some of it is justified and a lot of it is not. And I think understanding who he was as a human in this really dark story, it helped me grapple with some of his frankly more reprehensible political views, but also how he would arrive at them and sort of trying to figure out his own internal logic. And I think a lot of it just was, well, it would be, he would be carried along by people in, in his orbit. And that, that was, that's a very powerful thing for good or for ill. Uh, John says in the chat, virality equals morality. Interesting thought, is there a cure? <sighs> I don't know. I, I mean, the thing I also arrive with Scoundrel is as I kept working on it, I would try to envision other scenarios in which it could have played out differently. And unfortunately, I kind of landed on it couldn't. This is the only way it would have gone down as twisty and crazy and horrible as it turned out. And that's, I think, a function of the flaws of the American criminal justice system, that someone is convicted and they can appeal and find errors in how the case was handled and that can be reversed. And because it was 1957 and the Supreme Court had not come down with their rulings on interrogations and the Miranda warnings had not come into effect. So you could conduct your interrogation in ways that just would be impossible now. Like you just, you couldn't have a, the members of the press being out in the field with Edgar as he's like searching for stuff with the police or obviously the, the level of brutality while it unfortunately still happens, it, I don't, it, it just happened at a clip that was far more pervasive because there was no accountability. So working on Scoundrel really made me question a lot of how uh, infallible the American criminal justice system. And I think that recent history has shown just how porous and broken it is. But other solutions are not presenting themselves and I wish that they were. We have a comment in the um, Q&A that's uh, from an anonymous attendee. Very interesting that it brings attention to prison reform. I suppose uh, we're talking about um, Buckley, uh, you know, uh, corresponding with um, corresponding with Edgar. Oh, in terms of the of prison reform and the like. Or I'm not uh, really, I'm not really, I'm not really parsing what that comment's about. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, it, it was from a few minutes ago, um, but they, I guess, they were saying in regards to that. If you want to follow up, anonymous. <laughs> But we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Can you talk about this work you did discovering Sophie Wilkins? Well, so when I began initial work on what became Scoundrel, um, the book was not called Scoundrel. The title that I went in and sold the proposal with was The Convict and the Conservative, which for those who have some familiarity with recent-ish journalism history, there was a book called The Journalist and the Murderer by the New Yorker writer, Janet Malcolm, who died last year. And she was writing about a lawsuit between um, Jeffrey McDonald, a man who was and is still in prison for the murder of his family, although he has very vociferously protested his innocence, and Joe McGinnis, who would write about the case and get himself on the defense team and really in bed. But the book that was published, Fatal Vision, in 1983, did an about face where he's like, yeah, I did all that, and I told McDonald that I believed in his innocence, but actually, no, he's guilty as hell. So McDonald sues him. And Janet Malcolm writes about it, and it opens, and I'm going to botch the paraphrasing, but this idea of like any journalist who is too stupid not to understand that uh, they're full of themselves or... And it got people really mad in 1989. It's like journalists do not like to reflect upon their own behavior, but uh, it was really important. And it's a book that I reread every year because I don't think it's just about McGinnis and McDonald. I think it applies to Norman Mailer and Jack Henry Abbott or William F. Buckley and Edgar Smith. But when I randomly discovered that Sophie Wilkins had these papers at Columbia University, I didn't really know that much about her. And as I mentioned, I just thought I was going to look at professional correspondence between an author and an editor. But when I realized how 
personal and intimate and inappropriate and salacious this correspondence really was, I knew that there was a much bigger story at work and that she was vital to telling the story. Like, I really believe that without Sophie Wilkins, there would be no book. That was, um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, we actually, it looks like we had a clarification. Something oh. about like an, it was an exclamation point, not a question. No, 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 that was that was actually me. I was uh, thanking oh. someone for attending. We have a few more minutes and, left if anyone wants to get um, some questions or comments in. No, the uh, anonymous was saying, hi, I was just curious if the correspondence between Buckley and Smith brought attention for the need to reform the prison system, even though Smith was guilty. Yes, and that was partially because of how Brief Against Death, his nonfiction book, was received. And also when he got out, he would do speaking engagements talking about prison reform and what needed to be done. And I think it's important to reflect on this particular time. There was a real moving away in American sentiment against the death penalty. And that's why just a few months after Smith finally gets out, the death penalty is repealed for a while on, on the grounds of uh, cruel and unusual punishment. But the very year that Edgar Smith nearly kills Lisa Osborne in uh, San Diego, he, the Supreme Court then rules that it can come back and states start reinstating the death penalty. And another thing to point out is that when Edgar was released, he had served longer than anybody at the time on death row. But now we have people who've been on death row for 30, 40, even longer years. So it really feels like it's a time capsule of how, what we thought was going to happen in, in criminal justice of a more progressive bent and how there would be this subsequent backlash. But Scoundrel is being published when sentiment for the death penalty is also increasingly on the wane because states are increasingly finding it difficult to find any way of actually executing anyone. A lot of drug companies really blanched at this idea that their drugs could be used to kill people. So they just flat out said, no, you can't use our drugs. And then now certain states are trying to find like their way back to the firing squad or the electric chair. And that's, it's just not practical because it's, it costs so much more to house someone on death row than it does uh, in gen pop. And there are a lot of problems with how, you know, keeping somebody in prison without parole and, you know, there are just a lot of questions that we still struggle to ask with respect to punishment versus rehabilitation, because it's just easy when people go to prison to just forget about them and not think that they're worth anything. And so even like, I don't necessarily think that scoundrel is instructive as like a cautionary tale that we should suddenly like make it more punitive. I don't believe that at all, but I do think it's important to understand how certain individuals got sucked into Edgar's orbit and made him into something he never was. Thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, I, I have a question. Are you working on something else at the moment? The answer is yes. I can't talk about the next nonfiction book quite yet, although it is sort of an extension of the work that I've been doing. But once I'm done with the promotional stuff for Scoundrel, my next immediate project is to edit another anthology of true crime writing. And I'm hoping that the pieces that I collect uh, will reflect what's been going on in a pandemic with racial reckonings, with systemic injustice. So for those who are familiar with Unspeakable Acts, it's in three parts where the first part was sort of more traditional feature writing. The second was essays of where crime meets culture. And the third was more systemic approaches. So I'm hoping that this anthology will just really take that third section and run with it even more and just interrogate the genre all that much more. It's interesting. Sounds interesting. Yeah, I was, it's um, recently uh, somebody referred to true crime to me as, this is going to sound crazy, self-care for anxious people. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've heard that of, as well. Yeah, which I haven't. Kind of, yeah, you haven't, Stacey, really. No, the uh, most I, I see is, you know, as popular popularized about like how women love it. That's I usually see that like, you know, the SNL skit that yeah. you actually showed me, Jessica. Of, like, oh, the, the, oh, the, yeah, the like, watch your murder show. Yeah. Yeah. Like get yep. my, my wine glass. I, I don't have a glass on me to like fake that. 
but or something like that um the what i see on tiktok of oh you know like you versus your girl watching a true crime thing like you know it's like oh my god the the guy is always like and the girl's like yeah popcorn like this great like that but it's interesting to see of true crime that like what i've never heard that so i find it interesting well i I think it has a lot to do with women are just under threat a lot like just this is the what the culture has has made of of it that you grow up and you're told don't wear that don't go here stick to this plan don't deviate because something terrible might happen and so essentially just living your life like you're constantly under threat and under guard means that when you're watching true crime narratives and immersing yourself in the worst thing that can happen to people it's like oh okay now my anxiety has a place to go, therefore I feel better. And it's, you know, it's like I mentioned it before, it's not really true, but it is a, a brain response. So it is important to just sort of sit with that, but also recognize that if something happens to you, it's still pretty rare and random if it's a stranger. It's a lot less so if it's someone you love or your family or someone close to you, which is why intimate partner violence stories are so prevalent, but they're less likely to really get anywhere from a media standpoint, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. And just kind of going back to this sort of brain response, you know, it's interesting because I know I've said to Stacey several times um, that when I was younger, I used to, when I was homesick as a child, I my default was unsolved mysteries. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, something about, you know, I, and my parents were like, were kind of helicopter parents. And I was always being told the things that were going to happen to me because this is what could happen. So watching these shows in a way, like while having a fever was almost like sweating everything out, you know, sweating this anxiety out. Yeah. Um, but do you, um, I mean, do you have like, Obviously, you know, you write a lot about true crime. Do you have like a feeling in general, like a thought about true crime as entertainment, like a definitive, um, I don't want to say opinion on it, but you know, um, is there like, are the scales balanced or do you feel like they're very unbalanced towards glorifying the perpetrator? I've been heartened by a lot of the work that's been done to kind of get away from true crime as mere entertainment. And I've been trying to sort of do my part to push that as well with the anthology and with my books. Um, other work like that I re- recently loved, a fellow, a, a Long Island author and dear friend of mine, Elon Green, his book Last Call, which came out last year and it should be out in paperback in June, just does amazing work in illuminating the lives of men who were gay and sometimes closeted in the 80s and 90s who fell victim to a serial killer stalking uh, bars in Manhattan. And you really get to know the men, you know very little about the killer and that was by design. And it's just done in a way that I've read the book multiple times and it's it's so good. Or sort of like a meta true crime book that Rachel Monroe, who's a staff writer at The New Yorker wrote called Savage Appetites, where she takes stories that would fall into archetypes of the victim, the killer, the the cop, the detective, this, that, and really sort of shows how these archetypes came into being and how they should be interrogated and, and and critiqued. And it's a wonderful book. And so it's just work along those lines or there's so many true crime podcasts, but I'm very picky and I tend to like the ones that are rigorously journalistic and investigative. And I once said on a podcast, it was, I think, The Argument, which is a New York Times one, I was talking with Rabia Chaudhry, who was the lawyer who brought the Adnan Syed case to uh, Sarah Koenig in series and one of Serial. And she hosts her own show, Undisclosed, which is about wrongful, uh, possible wrongful convictions. And so we were debating this subject and it became this like very nuanced thing. But ultimately what I came down to was, yeah, we shouldn't, I know that we shouldn't hold sort of chat show types to the same standard as rigorous investigative journalism, but I can't help it, I'm going to do it anyway. So I I always just want the highest possible standard for anything, but especially for true crime. 
Sarah, thank you so much. It was wonderful having you on. Um, I thank you so, so much. Please come back at some point. Uh, yeah, I would love that. Open doors. Thank Open you. Doors. This was truly, truly wonderful. And I'm so glad I could talk about scoundrel and crime writing and with all of you. So I really appreciate it. Thank oh, you so yeah, much. Yeah. So um, for all of those who are still on, if you want to tell everybody how uh, they missed this and they should have watched it, you can watch it on the Facebook Live page for Syosset Libraries Trending. And there will be um, a video up on the Syosset Libraries YouTube with it the next week or so. Uh, we're in the process of overhauling our YouTube. So it's been a little <laughs> bit slower than usual. Sorry. Sarah, come on back anytime you want. And yeah, uh, thank you. Welcome. You and can I'll get the book at libraries. Yes. It's also uh, an audio book if you're like yes. me and you like listening to it. It's available on Libby um, and your local indie bookstore if you just absolutely must have it and pass it to yeah. uh, your journalistic true crime friends in your life as well. Um, on behalf of Syosset Public Library, thanks to everyone for sharing your lunch break with us and Sarah Weidman, um, and we will see you all real soon. Bye. Bye.